And we've got a fascinating panel on women's football coming next here on the WFS stage. In terms of just sort of thoughts off the back of that panel, football becoming ever more physical, said Lorena Torres from you first. It's very interesting that element is the freedom of footballers to be creative and the art being overall by the science. Who knows? A lot of data is suggesting that. We're focusing a lot on data. We don't just want information. What we really want is knowledge. And how many different types of data do we have? Open data, big data, smart data, and as Esteban was saying, predictive data. And people need to work together rather than separately. So yeah, we're going to move straight on to our next panel. We are catching up now here on day one of WFS Europe 2022. So if you want to find out about how women's football is now attracting some serious attention and why and how and where it goes from here, please stick around here on the WFS stage over on the Sevilla FC stage, a conversation centered around purpose involving Mohamed Yunus from Yunus Sports Hub. And an early shout to say, don't forget once again to post on social media at WF Summit on Twitter, at World Football Summit on Instagram, hashtag is WFS Europe. Simple as that. Um, okay, so on we go. Now, in the wake of COVID, there was a survey done by FIFPRO, who are the world organization representing players. As a result of which, the FIFPRO General Secretary, Jonas Bear Hoffman, said that women's football was being, in his words, routinely overlooked in many parts of the world, and that alarmingly, there is a real danger that progress towards gender equality in parts of world football would be set back years. Well, let's back them up with some stats. In 47% of the countries surveyed, women footballers had wages cut or suspended. In 40% of countries, players received no mental or physical health support. In 69% of countries, communication with players was regarded as poor or very poor as a result of COVID. But that's not the whole story because thankfully, recent events post-pandemic have pushed in an altogether different direction. Fantastic European Championship held in England uh, in the summer, won by the hosts as well, in a dramatic final against Germany. Barcelona, or Barça Femini, as they're known, twice recorded record crowds, world record crowds, in their run to the Champions League final. It was a competition broadcast by DAZN and on YouTube to maximize the audience. And over in the UK, we are into the second season of a landmark groundbreaking rights deal for the WSL, the Women's Super League, with Sky, the BBC, and the FA. And I told you about a world record crowd, but the world record fee for the transfer of a female footballer has also recently been broken. Kira Walsh moving to Barça Femini, and there is genuine hope and excitement for the game going forward. It has momentum. It can choose which path it takes, how much it decides to follow what the men have done, and how much it wants to plot a different route. Plenty to discuss then in this next round table entitled Game Changing Deals and More, why the cash influx in women's football is paying off is brought to you in partnership with Nielsen Sports. So please welcome your panel of speakers. Here they are. Head of women's football at ECA, Claire Bloomfield. Uh, Managing Director, Southern Europe, Menapi Latam at Nielsen Sports, Samantha Lamberti. Rights Director, women's sports at DAZN, Andrea Akblad. And chairing the conversation for us, co-founder and COO at Access Stars, Kate Hamer. Ladies, welcome along to World Football Summit. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. David, morning everyone. Uh, we're just going to set the scene to start off with with a video, if the guys can play that for us. Last year, we asked what if. What if there were more eyes on women's football? What if it was free for all the world to see? And tens of millions of people tuned in. What if there were more cameras to capture more action? More pundits. Let's get into it as soon as we can. More press. What if we took over the world's most historic stadiums so fans could set records just to break them again? What if new icons were created and little girls could see themselves on the pitch? What if we stopped comparing men's and women's football and started marching to the beat of our own drum? This year, together, we said no more what ifs, just more jaw dropping football.
everyone got the goosebump check from that. I always like a good goosebump video. Um, so I think that really illustrates what this whole session is around. Obviously, the women's game is growing. There is more coverage by broadcasters, more fans in stadia, more sponsors getting involved. Um, if I come to you first, Sam, can you help quantify some of that growth from a stats perspective? And thanks for having us today. Um, the growth is now undeniable, right? We see it, we feel it, and, and, and it's everywhere. But um, what is, for me, more astonishing is the fact that you can feel this through the fans. Um, we, you know, as an Ilta Sports, we measure a little bit of everything. <laughs> And we noticed that for the 2021 season of the Women's Super League in the UK, the live audience had an increase of more than 500% compared to the year before, which is uh, incredible. Um, it's something that we have seen everywhere, though. It's not only when they watch, but it's also how fans engage, and they engage more. We ran an analysis um, not long ago uh, on the women's football clubs in Italy, which is a market that is less mature than UK in terms of football, right? And we noticed that in the last two years, their following and their engagement has grown, uh, grown by 65%, uh, which is incredible. Um, we saw it before, FC Barcelona and the women's team, they have had the top two uh, stadium attendance uh, of you know, the, the entire organization, more than 90,000 people attending the game. Um, but what I think really shows the interest from everyone and the fact that I think now all the stakeholders in the value chain are ready to invest and they feel that they can do it, is the fact that rights holders, football rights holders, have started unbundling the rights. Before, when you were selling um, uh, you know, a men package in terms of sponsorship, um, somehow women's rights were sunk in there, <laughs> if you allow me the term. Um, now they're unbundled, and this has generated a growth in investment. The investment that we have seen after the pandemic is three times bigger than what it was before the pandemic in 2019. So I think these numbers really show the fact that something is, is moving. And um, at the heart of this, for me, there is always uh, funds as well, and what they are demanding, and the fact that they want to see now women playing in the right way. Absolutely. And presumably, those sort of stats were things that influenced the decisions at the zone to invest in the Champions League. Andrea, do you want to tell us a bit about the journey to, to that? Yes, I mean, it's, um, I believe that this is the most uh, dynamic period ever for professional women's football, and it's happening now. And and also now it's unstoppable. And um, there are a number of key factors driving that. Um, I'm very proud that The Zone is one of uh, those who are driving some meaningful change in this space. And uh, when we talk about those key factors driving it, like back to what you said, said as well, it's the unbundling, um, yeah. what has been previously so together with youth competitions or men's competitions um, to more uh, leagues are getting into professional status um, yeah. for the games are moving to bigger stadiums. And um, yeah, it's a lot of ripple effects as well as um, reasons how we got to this point. And obviously uh, broadcasters investment is absolutely key yeah. into this. Um, the reason we, or we believe that when we, we um, invested into the UEFA Women's Champions League now, almost two years ago, was that with the right amount of investment and with the right amount of promotion and marketing put behind it and with the coverage that we give all around um, the competitions and to solve that decades-long fragmentation, so to give easier access for fans to to um, watch the best of women's football, um, it can begin to compete with men's competitions, and it also makes great a uh, global proposition for us as a business. So 
actually fast forward less than a year later, we actually further doubled down our investment. And I'm very happy to talk about it here in Spain that we became the home of the newly formed Women's Professional League, Liga F as well. You know, in Spain we had the men's uh, football, but even better, now we have the women's as well. And uh, we're very excited about that. And uh, maybe just one more thing to add to this is that we all talk about it from a professional perspective and we will continue to do that too, but also from a personal view, it's, it's quite undoubtedly there. When I, I have a six-year-old daughter who is pretty uh, mad about football, I don't know how, but <laughs> she is. And um, yeah, I just witness it through being a, being a mom as well, how women's football has now broken into the mainstream. Yeah. Uh, how we are filling out the sticker album for the Euros together, um, how she's recognizing the players on screen. We can watch that on, on TV on a regular basis. She's been at Wembley at a sold out crowd. And yeah, so it's, it's really there and it's really um, undoubtedly happening now and it's unstoppable. Yeah, I think especially the experience that young kids are getting now of women's football compared to what we had. I mean, I just had Paul Gascoigne's book that I used to do his soccer skills in my back garden. But, um, <laughs> Claire, from an ECO perspective, you obviously launched the first strategy for the women's game back in 2020, and that's going from strength to strength. I understand there's a new joint venture with UEFA. I'm not sure how much you can tell us about that, but I'll hand over to you. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I mean, there is a, a hugely uh, exciting and successful ongoing media rights sales process happening right now. So that's uh, focused around the men's UEFA club competitions post 2024. But I certainly hope that in the not too distant future, we're sat here again talking about the success of the media rights sales process also being run by the joint venture for the cycle post 2025. Um, but if I can actually just skip back to, to the, the points that uh, Andrea was making, um, I think it's important to note that we need the broadcasters, we need the media rights holders to truly understand women's football and also understand how to connect with their fans and how the fans connect with the product. Um, and from the outset, it was very clear that DAZN were here for the long haul. Um, this was a project that we're hugely passionate about. And actually the collaboration between ECA and DAZN from those early days um, was hugely significant. Um, and it's allowed us to make sure that the, the clubs are truly bought into to, um, to this deal and the, the potential that it, that it has. Because we have to accept that as clubs, we also have a responsibility to make this deal a success. Yeah, so I think you mentioned in there collaboration is super key for the growth of this game and the stakeholders that are involved up until this point have obviously collaborated really well. It's now broadening out much further. There's new sponsors coming in, new broadcasters and stuff. From each of your perspectives, what are the sort of key learnings in your area that additional, for example, broadcasters now coming in, like how, what do they need to do? It's not just about kind of buying the rights, is it? What's the sort of responsibility they've got to help grow the game. Yeah, I mean, from a, yes, again, like from a broadcaster perspective and a platform perspective, it's, there are a number of ways in which we can empower the growth of the game. Um, first of all, to give it coverage. And I don't just talk about the 90 minutes and then we show the live game, but mm -hmm. it's everything else around the game. We're talking about um, you know, women's football where it's been decades and decades of lack of visibility and lack of coverage. So it's also about educating new fans who come on board. What's the history of the competitions? Who are the key players? Um, but also to bring in a younger audience, so a lot of lifestyle, um, as well as the compilations. So to really to serve um, the most loyal fans to the very new ones um, as well. And we put quite significant investment into creating all those additional content as well with weekly shows or um, uh, we did a, a We All Right City series in the, in the first, first season of the UEFA Women's Champions League where we wanted to showcase the um, football fandom of women's football in some of those key cities like uh, Madrid and Munich and, and Turin. 
and uh, we also invested into the first ever documentary series, um, the One Team One Dream. This is Chelsea, uh, which was really one of its kind, and and they're all factors to to grow the game. So to give that all around non-stop coverage, um, again rather than just sporadic around the competition, but an all year long comms and news um, pieces to, to come out as well. Um, as well as to solve that uh, fragmentation and lack of access, which we had for many, many years, mm -hmm. so that fans don't have to scramble through uh, social media uh, yeah. channels okay. and, and to see where can I watch Chelsea's Women's Champions League game, or where can I watch Barcelona? That is exactly the point, right? Giving access. Yes, and that uh, consistency. Yes. And that I know that if I show up to the Zone yeah. YouTube channel or, or the Zone platform, that I will get my women's football fix in these in these yeah. leagues, wherever I am in the world. So I believe those are all our responsibilities. And again, from a more broader societal perspective as well, to inspire the next generation and. Um, so that a little girl can, you know, once they watched the game uh, and some uh, Putellas dribble, then they can pick up the ball, go outside and practice, because boys could do that, mm -hmm. like, for decades and decades and decades, and now young girls can do that. And, um, yeah, so I think those are, like, the key responsibilities from a broadcast yeah, perspective. Yeah, and if I just can add like just one point to what Andrea said, um, you know, the accessibility and the availability of content is um, is very important. And not only for women's sport, but for everything, right? It's about building a story around what the sport is, and in this case, it's for women. Um, I always like to make this example that doesn't have anything to do with women's football, but if we look at Drive to Survive, made by Formula One, right, that is an example, is an established sport that is somehow losing funds, right, for reason or another, because people couldn't understand the sport or couldn't understand what was behind there, but then everything changed when they, they made the content available to people that could understand more, and that's the same thing that we have to do with with women's football, I think is everyone's responsibility uh, to give this access and create mental availability, right? What, what do I watch today? Men, football, Formula One, and women's football, right? As to be in, in there, in, in the funds. And I think it's there, like, I can talk about stats all day long, but <laughs> it's, we, uh, fans want to see more of this. Yeah. Um, they're open to, um, you know, not leave behind what's traditional, but open to new, new things or giving the right to be to sport like women's football. I think with the zone partnership has also been so successful, so successful to, to, to date is, is because that digital first behavior, that mentality of the supporters was already there. Um, it's only in the sort of last 12 months or so, it's become the norm to be able to turn on your TV and see a live women's football match. Typically, historically, I'm many of us here, I'm sure, we're used to scouring the internet, desperate to find a way to tune into the game. Um, and, you know, Dezon have, have made that possible now by being able to watch it either embedded on a club platform or on the Dezon platform or YouTube. So I think this is another reason why this, um, this partnership has, has worked in the way that it has. Um, and what's been great is, as uh, Andrea mentioned, is the, the storytelling that has packaged these live games. Um, and I, I'm sure it's something Andrea can talk about in more detail, but you know, we, we worked with the clubs to encourage them to let down their guards a little bit, uh, provide some more access. And it meant that we saw, for example, um, a coach at Wolfsburg being mic'd up during a warm-up um, and was giving that comment and analysis um, so this is kind of another space in which women's football can really innovate um, and we can lead. So it, it's been fantastic to see. Great. And how important are the players themselves for this growth? You know, particularly if we're talking about the storytelling and the kind of background to the game and stuff. I don't know, Sam, if you've got any sort of insight in terms of social media and the way key players are growing the game. Yeah, so I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like to take a step back on this one. Um, 
because players are really important, right? In any sport, women, men, anything is, uh, is at the heart of it. We, we done a research globally, which is called Nielsen Fund Insight, and we found out just last year that actually 70% of the global, more than 70% of the global population believe that women athletes, women can be role model, right? And if you only look, forget about women and men, forget about anything, um, athletes are influencers, okay? Um, we, through our stats, we know they actually have a power that is twice bigger than general influencers, so they can inspire people. If you put these two things together, you realize how important is the role of, uh, of women. Um, we have analyzed um, you know, the social media following of um, a big global number of women football players. Um, and the following uh, in the last year has grown by 37%. And they managed to reach 10 million followers altogether, which is pretty big target uh, for them. But what is more uh, interesting to me is the fact that when we compare these female football players with male football players, the engagement rate actually is the same. It's 7% for women and 8% for men. But the sponsorship investments in there, for example, are, I don't even want to say, like they're not comparable, right? Yeah. So it means that there is a power there for women as football players to be there, mm -hmm. right? And the more we can um, not promote them, but help them show what they do, the power, the struggle, the commitment to the game and to the sport that they have, the more they will aspire and they will help the game grow. No, definitely. And I think it's interesting as well, obviously, the more the game is growing, there's more different levels of the game that are available then for sponsors of all sizes to be getting involved and investing, you know, however small or big their marketing budgets are. I suppose that then brings us on to the question of how do we make sure that we're looking at the whole infrastructure of the game and, you know, it's not just sort of cash coming in, but there is advice about how best should that be spent, for example, by the clubs. Claire, I don't know if you want to touch on that. Yeah, I, th I think it's hugely important. We, we need to be thinking about several aspects of competition and, and the kind of commercial strategy that sits around that. Um, whilst getting the commercial strategy right is crucial, um, driving the growth, professionalization of the game itself um, is also key. And there's lots of ways that, that we can do that. Um, and the ECA strategy kind of sets out six distinct uh, strategic goals that, that we're following to try and um, uplift the game in multiple ways simultaneously. Um, but I think it's also important that we're thinking about when that money comes into the clubs, how is it spent in a way which is in a kind of financially sustainable approach? Um, that we can perhaps steer, whether it's through club licensing or um, sometimes through education, that we're focusing on things like elite environments. Um, if we're increasing the performance um, and the quality of play, ultimately that then generates more interest from supporters, more passionate supporters. Broadcasters, sponsors also want to join the party, if you like, and they want to be part of that. So it's very much a, a cycle, um, and it is about all of the stakeholders working together. Um, and, and on a personal note, that's one of the reasons why I love working in women's football so much, is because there is this genuine willingness to work together. And even though sometimes you might sit on opposite sides of the table and might not necessarily always agree, there is a real willingness to work towards this end goal that we all share. Yeah, well, everyone benefits if they collaborate, don't they? So it's definitely <laughs> the right thing to do. What, um, what should we be expecting from sponsors in terms of their responsibility to the game, especially people that are maybe seeing an opportunity now that it's a growth game and they want to get involved? How do we make sure that people aren't just sort of trying to jump on the bandwagon to make a quick book, but are mm -hmm. actually going to support the growth of the game? I think that's a really important point. Um, for many years, the game relied on pioneers like David Dean at Arsenal, Jean-Michel Aulas, ECA board member, the chair of our executive committee, 
and obviously president of Olympic Lyonnais, um, because of this visionary approach that, that they had. Um, obviously, Arsenal is an example where you can buy sponsorship with the club, with the women's team, even if you haven't had a prior relationship with the men's team. Um, and I think this is kind of a testament to the, the confidence and the maturity um, of the sort of market for, for women's football sponsorship. Um, but I do think it's important that at this point we, we give a nod to those who have very much led the way. And Sam, when you're sort of advising sponsors and looking at potential opportunities for them, what sort of advice do you give to them about getting involved in the game? Yeah, well, the approach we take is the one I said at the beginning all the time, right? Which is look at the funds, understand what the funds are, are, are looking for. Um, in the UK, you have like 54% <coughs> of the population that um, wants to stand for uh, social causes, uh, equal opportunities. And this same amount of people actually um, are more willing to buy a product from a brand that stands for the same rights and for the same social causes. Um, and this is where the opportunity comes from. And this is at the top of the agenda of any sponsor anyway, any brand. And they do see, um, I, I can tell from what we see when we talk to them, right, that we do see the brands investing in women's football or women's sport, um, not because it's easy, not because they have to fill a gap, but because they're trying to create a strategy uh, around it and collaborate with the right holders to create the strategy. Um, I think there is a need, um, the, bene the, the benefit is mutual, right, between the sponsors and, and, and the rights holders. And I think the, the main thing is to understand where the best pair between the two is, because ultimately, um, while the brand is interested in getting the women football content, right, or sponsoring this property because it's aligned with their values, it's aligned with their strategy, um, at the same time, they can give back know-how to the right soul that to help create this content, right? Um, and I think this is their responsibility as a, a sponsor, is like making sure that the way they use the content and the content they create using, you know, the, the, the women's football property is the right one and gives the right message and follows what funds want to, which is, you know, standing for, um, things that we were not standing before and seeing women playing, you know, as professional as women do, uh, men do. So um, I, I, I think this is what, that's what we advise um, around, and that's where we start from all the time. Let's start from the funds and, and, and what they want. So how you build a story around that? Yeah. I'll probably, um, I mean, first of all, the changes that we're seeing are huge. Just to think about, again, going back to the personal level where going with my daughter to the supermarket and then seeing, um, I don't know, England players on a crisp packet or, mm -hmm. or on soft drinks covers. Like, this, this has never happened before. Mm -hmm. And it's brilliant to see me and breaking into that mainstream uh, or seeing Leah Williamson on, on the billboard and, and, and so forth. Seeing now Sam Kerr on the cover of the new uh, EA game mm -hmm. as well. It's, these are huge milestones. Um, and I would probably see brands in two categories. One of them is the more, say, pioneer brands who, who invested, even though there was a huge risk factor to yeah. it, uh, but they've taken that risk nevertheless, and now they're, those brands are synonymous with women's football. And the others are perhaps keeping it more safe, and, and have waited and waited until it's proven its success. And we're in that stage now. Yeah. And I expect a lot more brands investing into the women's game now because truly I, it's, it's not an opportunity to, to, to pass on. So, um, I mean, my, our doors are open as well to discuss. So okay. just let us know because <laughs> we're all here to grow the game. <laughs> and this is not even just limited to Europe. Um, I think we, we often draw quite interesting comparisons between the NWSL and the, the, the big clubs in, in Europe, the big leagues in Europe, 
naturally, obviously, given the organisation I represent, we, we want women's club football, we want Europe to be the, the powerhouse of women's club football. But I think there are important learnings we can take when we look across to some of the models in the United States, particularly with, with some of the newcomers, thinking San Diego Wave, Angel City, both taking very different approaches. Um, from what I understand, Angel City were going for something like 3 million US dollars in sponsorship. Mm -hmm. They reached over 11, if the, the media reports are, are accurate. And I think that's staggering. Um, it shows the growth, the excitement, the opportunity in, in a largely untapped market still. And this is the time to get on board. Um, I think it's really important that we're having conversations like this. Um, we're provided with this sort of forum and opportunity to, to push these messages. Because if you don't get on board now, it's too late. Well, you could probably still make money, but you won't look as cool. So <laughs> you want to get involved uh, now. <laughs> so you mentioned, obviously, learning stuff from the US. What about other women's sports? What are there key ones that we can kind of learn from or collaborate with, potentially? Yeah, I, I think we can actually collaborate and, and learn from other women's sports, um, not just from a commercial perspective. Um, so I can think of various regulatory challenges that we've looked to address and we've reached out to you know, the women's NBA, we've reached out to Cricket Australia, we've reached out to, to organisations all around the world to understand how they're tackling some of these challenges given that many of us are actually facing very similar challenges. So it is helpful that there is again this willingness for, for women's uh, sports organisations to, to share this knowledge. So whether it's something in, in high performance research or like I said, the sort of more regulatory uh, framework topics, there is um, certainly things we can take from them all. I would love to add to that, to what Claire said as well, that I think there is also, it's more women's football is now paving the way to many yeah. other, mm -hmm. perhaps women's sports or other sports as well. Um, we have, looked at tennis uh, previously as that was the sort of the one to aspire to but mm. how many other sports could you name that after its peak moment which was 2019 women's world cup um, endure such a big um, you know massive disruption that the yeah. covid and and, and uh, that whole period of time was and yet come back and bounce back even stronger. So it really shows that enduring nature of it and the growth potential. And I think that's something to really hold on to. And also goes to the back to the fact that it's just, we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. Like this is only just the very beginning of it. And like imagine having all those games now in big stadiums because right now it's only, we, we see where it can be and it's proven, mm. but in, I'm really excited about the next where it can go. phase. Yes, and in the I next few years. I really don't think it's long before we see um, stakeholders on the men's side starting to look at what's happening in women's football and think, "Well, hang on a minute, maybe we can do it the way that they've done it." Mm. Um, I, I appreciate it's a hugely successful industry. Uh, it's an industry in its own right. Um, but we, as I said, have some flexibility and new space to innovate. And actually, perhaps we can lead the way. We talk often about not just copy and pasting how things have been done in, mm -hmm. in men's football, but we will innovate in a way that works for our objectives for women's football. But I really don't think it will be too long before, um, as I say, we're seeing men's stakeholders jump in and, and follow our lead. And are you seeing much collaboration with the men's game, like? proactively coming from the men's game to, to liaise with you on different things or do you think there's still big scope to do that? I think it's a really interesting one because we obviously have clubs with very different realities across Europe. We have those who are very much integrated with a men's club and then those standalone mm -hmm. women's clubs. But we, we talk a lot about the importance of having these key leaders in football voicing their support for women's football but then also showing it by backing the game financially long term. Um, we had a general assembly last week in Istanbul. Um, our ECA chairman, Nasser Al-Khalifi, 
stood down there and he was offering an address and said, let's be realistic, women's football needs major investment. And it's so powerful to have these influential figures in football give these messages, because that's exactly what we need to be telling the, the clubs around Europe. Um, you know, let's, let's be bold, let's be big with, with our ambitions, let's stop talking about the potential mm -hmm. and actually get on with it. Yeah. We as the zone are feeling quite confident about implementing a strategy around the Women's Champions League, and we've now a season down, we see that it's working, and we're using that as across the business on not just women's sports, but perhaps other sports as well, on how to, how to grow, and it's a, it's a transferable yeah. um, approach, and that's exactly what we're doing now with Liga F, for example, as well, and it's Great. very exciting. Yeah, I suppose it is that, like you were saying earlier, Claire, it's kind of been digital first, potentially, yeah. in the women's game, so there's still quite a lot of learning that you can take into men's sports and that, where those things are perhaps not happening currently. Um, so final question then, obviously we want to keep this growth going, we want to go from strength to strength, so for each of your different areas, what is the key focus to keep this growth going? I'll start with you, Andrea. Um, I think it's really important not to dial back now on the investment, on the coverage, on the accessibility, um, to keep it going and keep it growing. Well, for me, I'll go back to the investment point, right? Um, you do need monetary investment, uh, and definitely one way to get this investment is um, through the commercial relationship between uh, rights holder and brands, because they learn from each other. Um, I talked at the beginning about um, initiating a new sponsor sponsorship model, which is unbundling the rights. Mm -hmm. um, I think is giving the, the right return. Actually, we have calculated based on the data that we have that you know, rights holder can increase um, commercial revenues by 10% unbundling the rights. And this is in the current situation with none of the actions that you were talking about to put in place, right? So mm -hmm. the potential is, is even bigger. Um, and commercially, there is an untapped opportunity here. Um, you, you have more than 50%, 45% of the UK population, I think, uh, follows men's football and generates more than 300 million viewers for the uh, English Premier League. But you have 70% of the same population following women's football, generating 11 million viewership of the Women's Super League, right? So when you see the difference, you understand why the same people cannot keep watching women's football, right? It's just giving to them access and giving to them, to them availability. So for me, strengthening this relationship between the stakeholders even more and having um, stakeholders like the zone, um, you know, giving the access that people need and the consistency um, around it. We certainly have a responsibility to evaluate every possible proposition to develop the club competition landscape. This is huge. Um, not only does it provide the clubs the opportunity to play more relevant games in Europe and can also be used as a development tool, um, but we also provide more access to supporters to be able to jump in, get involved in the game, watch the game, attract broadcasters like DAZN to, to partner with um, a wider spectrum of competitions. Uh, we've talked about a lot, I mean, many people in this room will be familiar with the various debates about competition formats of, of the European club competitions. We still need to keep tweaking this to get it right. Um, obviously, the, the remodeling of the Women's Champions League from 20 to, 21 to 25 has brought significant change, significant improvements. But we, we shouldn't be satisfied with where we are now. We have to continue to, to push and, as I said, be ambitious. Um, and that's a, like a core part of, of our women's football strategy is looking at ways to further develop the, the competition landscape. And is that also sort of building out squads as well? Because mm -hmm. if there's going to be more games to be playing, they potentially want to do that. And I think you're doing some work, aren't you, in terms of like a youth development pathway and performance. That's and right. Stuff. Yeah, we're, we're about to start um, a piece of work which looks at an analyzing how young players, young female players are developed, how they're recruited, what sort of care they have for 
um, the sort of the parental support that is available, but also, you know, how are players being treated when they arrive? Um, how are they prepared for this kind of level of stardom, which is also about to, to kind of take off now? It, it's, it's very new for many of them but also looking how do we prepare them for this increased physicality and intensity of the game that we're seeing, and it's obviously only going one way. And sort of in line with that, we have um, a women's high performance advisory group. So it's club doctors, physios, sports scientists, you name it, they come together, um, and we're working actively on two huge research projects. One I would love to be able to talk to you about right now, but I can't. Um, <laughs> but it truly has the, the power to transform women's football globally. Um, and trying to address this gap in medical research is another big uh, project at ECA and, and with significant investment, but we obviously have a huge responsibility if we're increasing the number and the level of competitions that make sure we have the, the science, the knowledge, the understanding to be able to adapt training and, and injury rehabilitation at the same time. And I suppose that also offers more opportunity for sponsors, actually, in terms of they're yeah. getting involved in something at a deeper level, again, not just branding something, but yeah. they could be part of something that would be relevant for all women as well, probably a lot of the output that comes from that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think I wanted to add to that as well, that it's all those ripple effects and all those changes that are happening simultaneously in all levels and areas. Uh, and more leagues getting professional status and more broadcast deals and more brands getting involved and that drives to this exponential growth that is happening right now in, in women's football. Absolutely. Anybody got any final words? Anything you can... Go out there and back your women's team. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, I hope everybody is uh, very excited about the potential even bigger growth of women's football. And obviously, we've got three experts here. If anybody wants to speak to them during the next couple of days, they're around. So thank you very much. Thanks thank so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, ladies. Kate, excellent chairing as always. Lovely to work with you again. Thank, thank you very much indeed to all of you, Claire, Andrea, and also to Samantha. Um,